Calculating. All right, guys. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> you guys going to keep yourself in So, what we're going to be talking about today, uh, a few logistical announcements, then we'll basically be spending the rest of the time on discussing your program assignment that's due, uh, that's due Friday. First, taking any questions you guys may have, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the IO bound stuff that I emailed out last night uh, since a sufficient number of you have stumbled on that. I have a really fast question uh, regarding the uh, provided uh, examples of IO bound and CPU bound processes. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay. Just do stuff yeah. and we'll get to it. So, you should all know your programming assignments due Friday night. Have it in by then. That's the last thing you have to do before spring break. Nothing that you really need to do over spring break, except the grading sessions for this are going to be the week after spring break. We will release the grading session scheduler probably by Monday or Tuesday of spring break. Make sure you sign up for a grading session before you come back from spring break. It'll take five minutes of your spring break time. So, assuming you can give me that, you should all come back from spring break, signed up for a grading session, and ready to attend your grading session next week uh, or the week after next. Looking forward a little bit, your programming assignment three is due this Friday night. After this, you have two programming assignments and two problem sets remaining. There's really nobody on this side of the classroom today. <laughs> That's disconcerting. Uh, Two programming assignments and two problem sets remaining, those will all be fit into the five weeks that we effectively have, five weeks of class that we have after spring break. And the way it's going to work is the Friday night, last Friday night spring break, we'll release a problem set. You'll have a week to do it. That'll be due the first Friday after break. We will then release your first your programming assignment four. You'll essentially have a week and a half for that. We release programming assignment five. You have a week and a half for that. And then that last week of class, you have your final problem set, which also kind of serves as review for the final exam, which will be during finals period. Uh, the grading sessions for your final programming assignment will also be that last week of class. Um, questions on any of the logistics of this? All right, well, file that away. You'll be updated about it as it comes up. But things to look for in the short term are watch for an announcement about the grading session scheduler for this programming assignment. Make sure you sign up for a time before you get back from break, ideally. And on top of that, uh, watch for that next problem set coming down the pipe toward the end of break. Let's do that first week after break. All right? OK, so now we can open up for any questions people may have regarding the program assignment that's due Friday. I was just wondering uh, if you provided a new IO uh, um, uh, test for you, but you know, with the, the PI FC. Um, what is the policy of using that in our? You're welcome to use as much or a little of it as you see. Though. So we don't necessarily need to write our own. You don't. You can. I mean, mine or not. Yeah. 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 You, you need to put some information. Like, I mean, I wrote. Like, I wrote a. For example, I wrote a, a compute bound program with like, pi to fourteen digits and double you are, position. It was you too, are, too fast. <laughs> you are welcome to basically copy the core of the code out of both those programs and make them into functions mm -hmm. that you then call in your. So those programs don't fork or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. But you're welcome to use the core ideas in those programs as much or as little as you like. And I didn't release that this program yesterday, assuming that everyone should go back and rewrite their stuff. If you're getting good results and you think you're doing this okay, you're probably fine. But if you're struggling, an additional resource that you can use. Other questions on anything? Uh, I was, when I first started this, I was thinking about having function calls and instead of um, executing a new program, just forking and then calling a function. That's what I, I would recommend that you do. What? I said, I, I, that's what I recommend that you do. OK. Um, I, anyway. I chose not to because I wasn't sure if you mentioned in uh, 2400 that fork doesn't actually, sometimes it doesn't make a whole new set of memory for the child before it's needed. And I wasn't sure how that would affect performance. Is that something that we would be worried about? or? So you're going to be OK with fork. Um, there's not anything. So, so the reason. So the issue is you either, at some point, you're going to have to fork, period. Because even right. if you're executing, you have to fork. Right, right, right. right. Um, so the issue is either you just fork and then run your child code as functions called from the child side of that fork return, mm -hmm. or you fork and then exec to an entirely different program that runs your test code. The reason I recommended you just fork is because, I mean, so either way, you have to fork. So there's right, an issue right. with fork. You're screwed if you do. You're screwed if you don't. So assume the fork works OK. I, I'm okay. pretty sure that it does. I don't think there's any issue. I, I, I don't think it, I wasn't saying that it, would, that it was broken, but that it shouldn't it affect anything adversely. Okay. Um, 
the reason I didn't recommend you use Ezek is one, it's a little bit of added complexity, and two, I'm only 75% certain that scheduling, that, that the scheduler type is maintained across the Ezek call. I know that it's maintained across a fork call, but if you're going to be using Ezek, you need to be write a little test program that calls get scheduler right after uh, and as at the start of the program and make sure that it's preserving uh, preserving the Ezek across it. Right. Uh, POSX doesn't guarantee that it will, but I think the Linux implementation does. Okay, I, I set the scheduling policy inside the child program, yeah. so. Okay, well then it's not an issue. But I had assumed that you'd be setting the scheduling policy before you fork, and then, so it, it does get preserved across the fork. Mm -hmm. What happens across the exec is implementation specific, so you need to confirm what Linux does if you're gonna rely on it. Okay, thanks. But at the end of the day, I mean, do whichever, but using just forks is just as easy. Okay. Easier. Other questions? I mean, I can't talk about bounded IO the whole time, but I promise your questions are more interesting. Uh, last week, um, I forget what his, his name was, Tia came in. Juno? Juno. Um, he, I can't remember if he, he mentioned something that we need to uh, calculate, I guess. <laughs> the overhead, I guess, of, of forking a process. So essentially, we need to have a fork process that just forks and then nothing else. And then calculate the time that through maybe get usage or something like that. So we can subtract that from our overall time. Is that necessary? Or? I don't think that's necessary. Um, I mean, it's something you need to consult. The, the, it's not so much the overhead. The overhead of forking is going to be negligible. There is going to be context switching overhead and stuff. but. That's, I mean, you but definitely want to include want, that. Want to include because yeah, because well, yeah, the context connection. switching overhead is going to be one of the major influencers on how these different schedules behave. Right. So you definitely don't want to normalize that out. Right. If you, I mean, if you're writing your PhD dissertation, I'd say, yeah, maybe you want to go through and identify all the little biases and all your test cases and normalize for them. Right. But if you're writing this, I mean, but. Even then, if you're writing this correctly, the amount of time you spend forking and doing that overhead should be so insignificant I, I compared think to everything really else. Pick it up. I, I don't think you'd pick it up either. I mean, assuming, so we only go down to 100 second resolution. If you were going down to nanosecond resolution, you'd yeah. see it. And if you were gathering data at that level, it's like, but it's, I, I promise you the, I, I can't promise, but I'm almost certain that the overhead that would be that given by those kind of things is gonna fall well below the statistical significance of the rest of your data. It's going to get lost in the noise. So, don't increase the complexity unless you need to. He like, spent a lot of time also looking at. Uh, he, he calculated the content switch overhead, but he had to also calculate um, the overhead of just a read or write call, a simple call, um, and, he, and then you know, he subtract that out to calculate the real content switch. I mean, I think that last piece is really. I mean, so you need to consider all of these things. When yeah. So, so when you sit down to talk about why IO bound programs or any report where you're talking about why IO bound programs behave yeah. differently versus uh, so why maybe some schedulers handle I.O. bound programs better than other, you're going to want to think about things like how, con we'll look at that a little bit today, like how context switching works in an I.O. bound program, right? There's a lot of voluntary context switches in I.O. bound programs because you tend to voluntarily tell the CPU to swap you out anytime you have to go to an I.O. operation anyway. Um, so I don't think you need to sit down and specifically normalize any of that stuff out. You can kind of make some broad generalized assumptions. So, I mean, we've we talked about this before, but so you're essentially collecting metrics for user time, for system time, um, and you're collecting a metric for wall time, and in addition, you're collecting voluntary, sometimes we call them the context switches. And you're calculating the number of involuntary context switches. Right, so there are more metrics you can grab, but these are kind of what I consider to be the core metrics that are easy for you to get at and tell you a decent bit about what's going on. There's then at least one calculated metric that you probably want to get, which is the wait time, right? Um, so these are all given to you. This one you want to calculate. Uh, there's something else we need to say about this here in a sec. But in many ways, your wait time, this is this is going to represent the amount of time you spend 
this is this is your I/O time essentially, right? This is the amount of time you spend actually waiting on the hard disk to get stuff back. The system time is going to be the amount of time you spend in the hard disk driver, like actually executing like executing the processor commands that trigger the appropriate behavior on the hard disk. But all of the time you spend waiting on the hard disk, that's pretty much going to be your source of wait time. If you design your stuff appropriately, I mean, you're not really waiting on user input at any point, so there really shouldn't be many other sources of wait time. Um, my approach to this would be design your program such that there's only one possible thing that could be causing wait time, and then you can just assume that the wait time is equal to that time, right? So you do want to talk about things like the amount of time you've been waiting on the hard disk, but you don't have to, there's easy ways to get at it if you're careful about how you design your programs. So the few caveats to this are, you have to make a sudo call, I made a note to this effect too uh, last night, but you have to call sudo at some point or switch into a super user mode because you need to be a privileged user to call the real time scheduling parameters. This is done in that script that came with it and everything like that. You, any test run where you actually have to type in your password, you should probably throw out the data for it because waiting on sudo is actually gonna, I mean, the amount of time it takes you to type in your password into a sudo prompt contributes to your wall clock time which now means your wait time's not just your hard disk, or your wait time's not just, I mean, the wait time's gonna be zero in like that high thing, but it's not gonna be zero anymore, it's gonna be the amount of time it took you to type in your password. So, the nice thing about sudo is you only have to do that once, and then it'll remember it for the next hour or so, so it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a fundamental issue, but if you find yourself having to wait on user input for some reason or another, that's gonna screw up that test run. So throw out the data and run it again with it already knowing your sudo password, or do something clever in the script, like have it call sudo ls at the very beginning, right, to force you to type in your sudo password, and then when it actually matters, uh, you won't have to, it'll already be cached. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is this equation only works if you're using just one process or if you're on a single core system. If you're using more than one process on a multi-core system, this gets a little bit more complicated. Um, namely, your wall clock time is always that. It's your wall clock time. But on a multi-core system, when you have multiple processes that you're combining all the data for, these all become per CPU times. Which means a lot of you are going to start getting fun data where these add up to greater than this, uh, which you would think should be impossible, right? Like how can you spend more time in here than literally passed in the real world? Well, the answer is, if this is the amount of system time you spend on one CPU, then if you have two CPUs, these can, in the worst case, add up to twice this. So the way I'd recommend dealing with that is you need to make a few assumptions. The first assumption I would make is make sure you're running your testing in a nice environment where your test should be the primary load on the CPU. So don't be running other big stuff in the background, which you shouldn't be doing anyway. But if you make that assumption, you can assume that if we assume that the primary load is your test run, then we can all, that translates to saying that the wall clock time was all devoted to our test run. That's a little bit of a lie. There are going to be some, you know, some system processes you can't deal with. And if you're running in a VM, there's apparently some other stuff going on. If you're running in a VM, this applies to your host, right? You've got to make sure your host machine is running pretty much nothing other than that one VM to make this a decent assumption. Uh, but if we make the assumption that all that's running is our test suite, then we can assume that the wall clock time is equal to the total test suite time. Which means that if we want to calculate these individual things, we can effectively just multiply the wall clock time times the number of cores. That's how you would adapt this. So if you have two cores, you double your wall clock time, and then you would you can ignore that on this side altogether, right? And that will then let you calculate your wait time appropriately. Because you need to get this by subtracting these from the wall clock time. So that's one way to do it. I mean, you could also, if you've that same assumption, you can divide everything by the number of cores, right? So you can say, you could you could just divide all of these. So if you have two cores, you could cut all of these in half. There's, no, there's other ways to solve for this, but realize that if you were on a multi-core system running multiple processes, then you have to take that into account when you're, it only really matters when you would calculate the wait time, because otherwise your subtraction is going to give you negative numbers for wait time, and that's not is there a, uh, I know that this was an extra credit from the last problem, but is there a way to retrieve like how many cores are being used yeah. allocated to the system? It's pretty easy. Uh, if you cat the proc CPU file, it'll have listings in it. I mean, it basically lists all the information about your CPU and it has one section per core. Mm -hmm. So you can do this and then combine it with like a grep 
and you can search for the word that, I mean, so it says processor to start it. This is what I told you to do uh, last night to confirm. But um, yeah, you can essentially, then however many lines you grep this for processor, the number of lines that grep outputs, and there's even a flag you can throw to grep, will, there'll be one line per processor, or score. There's other ways of doing it. There's a library function that you can use that essentially, so you know what it is. Uh, some of you used it in the last assignment. There's a library function you can call that essentially does this for you. Yeah. Okay. So we can do uh, programmatically and yeah. calculate. There's not extra code for it this time. No. But if you're writing if you're writing a fancy script that calculates all of this jazz for you and spits it out mm -hmm. to a nice comma separated value list, then yeah, you can mm -hmm. there's ways to you can script this too. You can script this calculation. Um, right. There's one other thing that you need to consider if you're going to be using this math. The other thing you need to guarantee is you not only do you want to make sure that your test runs the only thing running for this to work out for you, but you need to make sure that the number of processes is sufficiently greater than the number of cores. So even if you have a 12 core system, if you're only running one process, you don't have to worry about this per course thing. Because one process can only run on one CPU at a time. So the total number of CPUs, assuming it's not, assuming it's not a multi-threaded process. Uh, a regular process can only run on one core at a time, so this math doesn't come into play. This math comes into play, like I said, you need both multiple cores and you need a bunch of processes running. And assuming that the data you're looking at is averaged over all these processes, that's how this math comes in. So again, if you only have two processes and two cores, you might be getting a little bit, it's gonna point this math, it has the potential to point this math a little bit because there are a few other things running on the system that you're gonna go off and run and that's gonna play with this. I would say that as long as the number of processes is more than twice the number of cores, you're well within the range where this math is fine. And especially as you dive into like the hundreds of processes, then this is a very safe assumption. Um, but if it's just one process at a time, I mean, so if you make your, if you're working on a dual core system and your smallest test run has 10 processes, you're gonna be fine. If you're working on a 12 core system and your smallest test run has 10 processes, that's where you're really gonna be in trouble. Because then it's really 10 twelfths, it's not, just timing, the fractions get more complicated. And if you're working on a 12 core system, just make your smallest test run 20 processes, right? Avoid the issue altogether. All right? Okay. Does that make sense? I don't mean to totally lose anyone on this. Um, okay. So that's kind of the calculating the wait time is a little bit more complex if you're using a multi core system. Um, the other side of this too is if you're running on the VM, actually nice, by show of hands, how many people are doing this on the VM? Okay. Definitely note that in your report. Because it's, I don't know, but it's gonna be interesting to see how the VM results look versus how the people running it directly on their metal results look. Um, you will, you can get good results off the VM, but the VM has the effect of essentially normalizing all your results a little bit because now there's a scheduler for your scheduler. Right, is one more level of indirection. So um, it's, it's gonna push everything a little bit more toward the center and your results aren't gonna be as differentiated as they would be on bare metal. I just had a question, I was thinking about this. Um, what can we do to minimize tasks running in the background, say like if Windows, if, if Linux is running on top of Windows, let's say. So I mean in Linux you don't need to worry about it. Right. Linux is, I mean, if you're running Dropbox on your VM, you should probably turn that off or anything else like that. But the default, the default VM install that I provided to you is pretty lightweight in the background processes. In Windows, I mean, go down to your task manager, close everything that can be closed. Okay. Don't be, I mean, yeah, keep internet, I mean, keep browsers closed. I mean, all that, in Windows, I would say, there's a limit on what you can do. I wouldn't worry about going to the task manager. If you can effectively close everything down here, other than you know the clock and the and the key stuff. The antivirus, right? Yeah, get rid of yeah, definitely get rid of any kind of antivirus software. Get rid of any. I mean, you don't have to get rid of it, but close it. Any kind of I mean, if iTunes is running in the background, anything else, close as much as you can easily close, and you'll probably use okay. it. I mean, yeah, but more importantly, just don't be watching a movie on one of your Google monitors and running your VM and your tests on the other. Right. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's really going to screw it up. Of context, which is um, how are you counting the number of voluntary versus involuntary? So that, do, you, do you have to be time will give it to you? They will give you both. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you don't have to be uh, forcing context switches to count the voluntaries. No, no. We'll uh, we'll look at that. Okay. And that's one of the uh, outputs on the 
our usage struct as well? Yeah, so everything, so the secret is time is calling our usage, right? So everything you can get in time, you can get in our, I mean, the reason you can get that stuff in GNU time is because if you look at the source code for GNU time, it basically forks, it, it just forks whatever process you get, on, it forks and uses whatever process you get on the command line, catches the R usage struct and prints it out to the screen. So they're really the same thing. It's just a matter of are you writing it in your program or are you using someone else's program? You can, that you can now isolate the processes. Yeah, so using get our usage is another way of solving this issue. Because if you're looking at one process at a time, this issue only comes into play when you're looking at the aggregate data across more than one process, right? Across a large number of processes. If you're actually using get our usage to grab the data for each process individually, yeah, these are, I mean, you don't, so your wall time then is going to be something even different, right? Mm -hmm. Your wall time is going to be much larger than these because your wall time is going to reflect the amount of time you were swapped out. Uh, so that actually gives you the ability to do an even nicer analysis of what the wall time really means. This is right. this is the crude analysis yeah. that you need to do if you're just grabbing the aggregate data. It's fine for the purposes of this assignment, but yeah, if you're grabbing it per process, you can get it even nicer stuff like how, I mean, you can actually, the wall time starts to mean something then. Yeah. That's how much time you spent waiting. So unlike the FIFO thing, your wall times are going to be across the chart. Your first process is going to have a wall time that's equal to this. Your last process is going to have a wall time that's huge. And each one's going to have a slightly larger wall mm -hmm. time. The round robin process, you would expect them all to have about the same wall time. Yeah. So it gives you an additional level of thing to measure that doesn't apply if you're just taking the aggregate data. Because when you add them all together, they're going to be the same thing. It's when you look at the distribution of them that you can actually see some interesting stuff. So if you are using did our usage, you can do some cool analysis of the wall time, but it's not required. And we'll talk a little bit more about context switching here in a sec. I can spell. Other processes are at the Wow. Other questions? Other questions? If there aren't other questions, I'll switch to talking a little bit about IO bound, which is fine. But I want you guys to make sure you uh, I think that was everything I needed to talk about. Those are kind of the common questions that have come up not related to IO bound, which is what we're going to talk about now. Um, so just in terms of thinking about this too, as you guys go to write your report, I mean, this is an experimental lab. You're not all going to get perfect data, right? And I would say to some extent it's unproductive getting hung up on what perfect data even means, right? No, if you ask me if you're getting the right answer, I have no idea. I, I do come and run the tests on your system and tell you what I think the right answer is, but there isn't really a right answer, right? It's an experiment. It's the point. The right answer will be whatever conclusions we can draw from all of your reports aggregated together when this is done. That's probably the closest we can get to anything being called a right answer. And even that is biased by however you guys ended up doing this. So the things to focus on are, yes, you don't want to make stupid mistakes. If your, your I.O. bound process shouldn't be spending 99% of its time on the CPU, right? That's probably not going to give you very good results. But if you can build your if you can build your test suite in a reasonably intelligent way, such that you can defend that the way that you built it, I mean in your report you should be able to defend that the choices you made in building your test suite reflect a decent understanding of how things work under the hood, then I would say the results you get are going to be good enough. They're going to be even if there's some mistakes in them, and they don't, or, or if you get really crappy data, which some of you will, uh, it's okay. We're not grading you on the quality of your data. We're grading you on the ability to build an intelligent set of tests that kind of reflect an understanding of what's going on. And where if you get crappy data, you should come up with an explanation for it. We're grading you on your ability to rationalize why some of these things were the way they were. Whether it's because you're working on the VM, or it's because maybe your I/O bound process wasn't I/O bound enough. I mean, there are various explanations to this. It's it's not so much a game of let's get perfect data, it's a game of let's build good tests, let's get the data we get, and then let's talk about it. Um, so that's the way I would be focusing your reports. I would rather read a really nicely reasoned report that has terrible data than read something that has perfect data but no ability to explain it. Okay? Okay, so. I will probably be reading a lot of your reports over spring break, so um, I don't know exactly what we're going to ask you to bring to your grading sessions, but I probably, at your grading sessions, expect to be able to talk through your code, which is maybe something you don't do quite as much of. I mean, you don't need to do a line-by-line -line explanation of your code in the report, right? You should say basically what it does, but you don't need to dive that deep. 
for the grading session, I probably will have you actually take a few codes, because I'm curious how you did, and then I'll have you talk to you about your results. Um, and I may or may not have read your paper before your grading session, but we'll see. Uh, but uh, I'll update you guys all on what exactly you need to bring to your grading sessions, whether that includes a printed copy of the report or not. Um, just stay tuned. Okay? Okay, so I have about 20 minutes left, and we're going to talk about I.O. bound. So when I was here two weeks ago, we talked about CPU bound processes. And just a quick refresher being, a CPU bound process is any process whose runtime primarily depends upon the speed and power of your CPU. If you get a faster CPU and it's a CPU bound process, it'll speed up. Ideally, I mean a perfect CPU bound process, if you double the power of your CPU, you will have the time of your runtime of your process, right? An I.O. bound process, on the other hand, depends almost not at all on the CPU speed of the system. Instead, it depends upon the I.O. speed of the system. Meaning that if I double speed my CPU, I'm gonna see no results. But depending upon what I.O. subsystem it's using, if I double the speed of that I.O. system, then I should have my runtime. So we talked about the pi example last week, which essentially just did the statistical calculation for pi. It spends most of its time calculating, I mean, the, the, the slowest part of that program is doing the power and square root calculation that's necessary to determine the distance from the center of the circle. That's all math, right? It's spending almost all of its time doing math, which is on the CPU's ALU, and just it's just cooking the CPU is essentially what it does. When we run that, that's where we get 99% or greater CPU time. We're effectively not spending any of our time waiting on anything. We're just running the processor as fast as the schedule will let us. This week, we're going to be talking about an I.O. bound example. And before we get into that, a few little caveats and discussions of I.O. on modern operating systems. So traditionally, the I.O. subsystem in your computer is the slowest part of your computer. And, and even today, that's still true. And because of this fact, I mean, your CPU, your RAM, all of the other parts have always been way faster than your hard disk. Everything's faster than the human, right? Which is part of the I.O. system. So if you count your keyboard, that's I.O. Its speed is dictated by how quickly a person can type. People can't type very fast uh, in, in CPU terms. So humans are slow, hard disks are slow, floppy drives are slow, tape drives are slow, CD drives are slow. All of your I.O. system tends to be the slowest part of your computer. And because of that, a lot of computer scientists have gotten their PhDs coming up with clever ways to make these inherently slow hardware behave as though it's faster than it actually is. Which is great for us in the real world because it helps to ensure, I mean, there was a time when every process was I.O. bound because that was the nature of the beast. We're actually in a world now where that's not true. Even I.O. heavy processes can do a pretty good job of not being I.O. bound. And we prefer things not to be I.O. bound because traditionally we've been able to make CPUs more powerful a lot more easily than we've been able to make I.O. faster. So if you have to have a bottleneck somewhere, we tend to think it's better to have a bottleneck on a CPU. It's easier to fix that than it is to have a bottleneck beyond the I.O., which, I mean, you're up against some fundamental limits more quickly than you are against the CPU. This may all change in 10 years when we really exceeded Moore's law, but for now, we'd rather the bottleneck be on the CPU. And because of that, we come up with clever ways to force the bottleneck to be on the CPU, even though our hardware might not pass. This is great, like I said, for writing programs because it allows you to write fairly fast programs, even though hard disks are still kind of ridiculously slow. This really sucks for writing an I.O. bound program because you essentially have to subvert the last 20 years of computer science in order to actually get a good I.O. bound program. So, Today's lesson is also titled, How Never to Write an I.O. Bound Program in Real Life, right? This is great if you're purposely trying to make an I.O. Bound benchmark. This is everything you would never do if you were actually writing a program that needs to do I.O. Because we're essentially purposely making it slow, um, which you know isn't generally good programming. Um, so we have the hard disk, and that's what I'm, there are various ways you can do I.O. for this. The hard disk is probably the easiest because it's a nice, consistent piece of hardware. You could have the human be your I.O. bottleneck, right? But then you're going to have to have someone sitting in front of your computer for the entire test run, test typing at a statistically predictable speed. You probably have to get some forms filled out so the people over in admin don't get mad at you using human subjects as part of your test, and there's all this other overhead you don't want to deal with. So we'll deal with using the hard disk. And the way hard disk systems on modern machines work is if you have your hard disk, which everyone in computer science draws as a circle or a cylinder like this, I don't know why, this is a hard disk. Or just don't actually look like this, but that's the way we draw them. memory. So this is the hard disk, and your hard disk then is connected to your system um, 
this is a logical diagram, but it's not actually, when, when you work with your program, so this is one way of doing it. Your program can more or less talk directly to the hard disk. This is a lie, it actually talks through, there's the OS driver. And then there's your program. <coughs> But uh, th this is one way to do it. Um, and this is kind of how it's done, except there's even more magic here. Associated with this driver, there is normally a large cache. So assume the part of this is full is follow up. And your program almost never talks directly. Your program generally talks through some kind of a nice library function, which also has a buffer. So effectively, you have a couple of buffers sitting between your program and this hard disk. Um, and then there's another thing, the hard disk itself, if it's a modern hard disk, has a buffer, uh, often a really big buffer um, by modern standards. These buffers can easily be in like the 64 megabyte plus range. Um, these buffers tend to be in the 64 to 128 megabyte range too. But the point of all of this is, when you write something from your program, it's not getting written directly to the disk. It's a lie. The OS is telling you it got written to the disk pretty much, I mean, if you're calling the library function, it's going to just return as soon as it thinks it can do okay things with it. Uh, so your write to disk is really just a write to this buffer, which is essentially you're copying some data somewhere in memory. You're not actually writing to the hard disk. Then, unbeknownst to you, while you go on to do other things, this buffer is going to eventually get flushed to the OS driver. When its buffer fills up, it's going to get flushed to the hard disk. When this buffer fills up, it's actually going to write to the disk. The slow part is actually writing to the disk. Just hitting all of these buffers, especially these two, because these are buffers in your RAM, that's so really fast, or, or relatively fast. Uh, this buffer is a little bit slower because it's off on a separate chip on your hard disk, um, and the hard disk itself is very slow. But if this is the system you're trying to get through to build an IO bound program, it's fairly difficult to do. There is a way to do it, and it's effectively, you have to make sure your read and writes are large and random, such that you break these buffers. I mean, if you grab data that's bigger than the buffer, you grab data that's random, such that it can't already be in the buffer, then you're effectively going to force it to go to disk. But if each of these is a 128 megabyte buffer, we're talking reads and writes into the gigabyte range if you actually want to break these buffers. So on the VM, that's not necessarily an option. Your VM, you're kind of limited to 30 gigs, I mean, you could up that, but even if you up that, if you're running 300 processes and each process needs to read and write two gigabyte files, unless you have a terabyte disk backing you, you just can't get away with that. So if you do have a big terabyte disk, that's one way to do it. Just make all of your reads and writes very large, try to do them randomly, don't do sequential ones, which is also added complexity, because you have to dance around the file to keep grabbing random data, but there are ways to do it. You can break these buffers using the standard system calls if you're random and you're big. But there are other challenges posed to that, including the physical limitations of a lot of the machines you guys are working on. So what we're going to look at is there's an additional way to break these buffers. Uh, first, we're going to skip the library functions. We're going to call, essentially, we're going to call directly into the OS system calls. So that's going to take care of one buffer for us. Or this is at least how I do it in my demo. Then we're going to use the additional benefit of talking directly with the OS driver is it gives us some extra parameters we can specify when we open up our file. And one of those parameters is a parameter that tells the system to do its best to avoid using buffers. So that is not perfect, but it does a pretty good job of nullifying these buffers such that we can appear as though we're writing straight back and forth to this. So, this is, I mean, and well, well, we'll start looking at it now, but this is essentially what we're going to try to do. And I'm not going to have time to go over all of the details, so I'll try to touch on the main points. And I really should have written two versions to demo this, but um, essentially I provided, this is what I emailed out last night, uh, this additional little example program called rw.c. This is the IO bound complement to pi.c, right? This doesn't mess with any schedulers or anything like that. It just uses the standard scheduler. You could write an rw-sketch equivalent, right, where you essentially lift out the code from this, wrap the code in this, and it. the same thing. As these two are related, you could make an equivalent, uh, an equivalent program to this. But 
you already have a demo of how to do that. I didn't feel the need to write another one. So this just, it, it avoids the scheduling issue altogether. All it does is try to be a good I.O. bound process. And it does a pretty good job at it. If we run the time command with dash b, it just tells it to give us all the data it, proper, it, it possibly can. And we run it on our RW. So RW, like Pi, takes a series of arguments. But if you don't specify them, it just uses some defaults that work reasonably well on this computer. Uh, so it reads from some input file and it writes to some output file. Essentially, I mean, in some ways, you can think of this program as it's, it's my implementation of copy. And stuff it'll do a few things copy can't do. It lets you specify the size of your output file regardless of the size of your input file. So it makes it easier for testing. Even if you only have a one kilobyte input file, you can specify a 10 megabyte output file. It'll just keep looping through the input file until it's reached an output file of a sufficient size. So it's kind of like an advanced copy command that lets you copy the exact size of the input file, a like regular copy, or lets you copy more or less than that. In which case, it just reads part of the input file or it reads the input file multiple times. But if we look at the data that this outputs, we're running the command RW, we see that it spends effectively no time on the CPU. This is spending all of its time on the hard disk. We spend 0 0.02 seconds in the system driver, and we spend 5.17 seconds total. So that effectively means our wait time in this case, because it's a single process, so we don't have to worry about this as a dual-core machine, but we can just do subtraction. Our wait time is going to be 5.15, right? So we're spending 5.15 seconds waiting out of 5.17 seconds total. It's hard to get much more I.O. bound than this. This would be in, uh, as opposed to like the Pi command, which if we look at the Pi command, it spends 99% of its time on the CPU. I mean, these are, our wait time is effectively zero, as we would expect. The idea of context switches came up earlier, so I'll just point it out again here. In the RW program, you see it gives you data for both voluntary and involuntary. The voluntary context switches is at 224, the involuntary is six. This is typical of a good I.O. bound program. You should have a lot of voluntary context switches because every time I go to do one of those read and writes, the program's gonna swap itself out, and that counts as a voluntary context switch. Uh, it's not gonna have very many involuntary context switches just because an involuntary context switch can only happen if I'm using the CPU and the scheduler has to force me out. I'm barely using the CPU at all in here, so there just aren't very many opportunities for it to involuntarily context switch me. On a mixed program, you would expect these to kind of, you'd see a nicer mix of these. That, again, as opposed to the Pi program, has one voluntary context switch and 29 involuntary context switches. So a CPU-bound program, your context switches are going to be largely involuntary. People okay with that? Okay. So that's what this program does. Uh, you can specify, I mean, if you look at the readme, it tells you all the different ways you can call it. Effectively, it takes up to four arguments, where the first argument is effectively the size of the output file you want to create. So you're telling it how many bytes you want it to copy. You then give it a block size. You don't have to just copy one byte at a time. And in fact, often you don't want to. Um, because of the way we're doing this, this actually doesn't matter quite as much. It sucks no matter what you put here, because even if we're just writing one byte, we're still forcing it to go all the way to the hard disk. If you're trying to break buffers without doing it the way I did it, this block size becomes a lot more significant. And you're going to need to pick a block size that's large enough to exceed your buffer to really get it to work nicely. Um, but the block size is essentially the chunks we're writing in, right? So we want to write this many bytes. We're going to do so in chunks of this size. So I think the defaults are, I'm going to write 100 kilobytes in one kilobyte chunks. So effectively, I'm actually going to access the disk 100 times, right? One kilobyte at a time, I need to do 100 kilobytes. That means I have to go to the disk 100 times. You can then give it the name of an input file, and you can give it the name of an output file, where, if you guys notice, it's actually already structured. The output file name automatically appends the process ID to it. This is just to, if you were going to go and add this around a port call, this makes your life easier because it, it's fine to have one input file because you're opening it read only, but you probably want different output files, you different processes to interfere with each other. This guarantees a unique output file name because it attacks the PID onto the end. People kind of clear on what this program does from a high level. We'll dance into the code for a few minutes. Okay, so if we actually look at the code for it, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but there's a series of includes up at the top series of defaults. This is essentially if you don't 
give it any arguments, this is what it's going to use. Uh, where the run we just saw where I didn't give it any arguments, like I said, it asks for one kilobyte. It does so in, it asks where it's going to copy a total of 100 kilobytes, one kilobyte at a time. Um, it's all written in just one function. The local variables are up here. Um, Things you may not allow, you, you guys all have access to this file, it's on the you iUpdate, know, the Moodle zip file, it's also on GitHub. So a few things worth pointing out. Because we're not using the C standard library IO functions, meaning fread, fwrite, fopen, all of that, those are C standard library functions, they use those nice file pointers that you guys have probably used before the capital file star. When you're using, those are all wrappers around what we're using, which is essentially the Linux system IO. And the Linux system IO, in real life, you don't tend to use it unless you absolutely have to because it's bad for portability. This is specific to Linux. Um, the nice thing about using the CCM library file I.O. is you can port it to Windows and then there are wrappers around whatever the Windows I.O. calls are. But we're going to dive down directly to Linux I.O. calls. And Linux I.O. calls don't use file pointers. They usually call file descriptors, which are effectively just hints. Where the way the operating system works is on the back end, the operating system keeps a table of all open files. It indexes those files by some file descriptor. That file descriptor is what it hands you. It's Think of it just as it's a unique number that identifies whatever file you're dealing with. So it's somewhat similar to what the file pointer does, and the, the file pointer includes the file descriptor and a whole bunch of other information that the library calls use. But we're not doing that, we're dancing underneath of it, we're using file descriptors instead. We then have our file names that are effectively just char arrays, we need to generate them, so we just make them as arrays. Uh, we keep track of some information here, this is what we're actually trying to do, our total transfer size, our block size. We have a transfer buffer. So we're copying from one file to another. We need some place to store that data intermediately from when we read it out before we can copy it back in. So this is essentially our transfer buffer. The size of this buffer just becomes our block size. So if we're telling it to copy one kilobyte at a time, we have a one kilobyte buffer. We read one kilobyte into the buffer. We take it out from the buffer. We write it to the file. Um, and then there's some statistics here that the program just keeps, with the exception of total bytes written, which is how it knows when to stop. The rest of these are just there for my own benefit. They're not inherent to the way the program works. They print pretty numbers at the end, so I can feel like I did something right. We go through a whole bunch of code, the only purpose of which is to handle all the input arguments. I'm not gonna spend time on it, because it does what you would expect it to do. If the input argument's present, it uses what the user inputs. If not, it uses the default. Then we get down to, we do a little bit of error checking. Namely, we've made a few simplifications in this program to make it easier to write. We're saying that the transfer size must be greater than the block size, although we're going to error out. We don't want to deal with what it means if you tell me you want to transfer one megabyte blocks, but you only want to transfer one byte. It's kind of ambiguous, so we're saying we're just not even going to allow that. Your block size has to be less than your transfer size. In addition to that, your block size has to be an even, your transfer size has to be an even multiple of your block sizes. We don't want to deal with the edge case where you get to the end of the file and you have to copy part of a block. Instead, we're just saying that if your block size is one kilobyte, your tra total transfer size has to be some, it has to be in kilobytes, it has to be some multiple of that. Uh, so this just airs out if either of those conditions aren't true. We allocate our buffer space just using malloc. It has to be done dynamically because we don't know what the block size they're going to specify is. So this is just done at runtime, standard malloc call. This is where things, th th this is actually where all the magic in this program happens, is in the open calls. So we're using open now instead of fopen. You can look up the man page for all the details, but I'll take you through it quickly. Open returns one of these file descriptors. In this case, we're opening the input files, so we set it to the input file descriptor. You pass it a char star, which reflects the path or file name. Uh, so this is just the file name we generated. Then you pass it a series of flags, and it's these flags that kind of let us do clever things. So. We're using open one because it bypasses the extra buffering of open, but two because it gives us access to these little, little flags, which let us ask for specific behaviors like not using buffers. You can give it any number of flags. They're all just these constants. They're defined in one of those files. If you look up the man page, it lists what they all are. If you want to use more than one, you just logical order them together. They're designed, they're essentially bit masks that get ordered together, but you can just worry about the constants. We're telling you we want to open it in read-only mode. That should be pretty self-explanatory. It's our input file when you can read it. This osync mode is then what is interesting. The osync mode tells it that you want to bypass as much of the buffering as possible and ensure that every read and every write is actually synced to the physical hard disk. Meaning that when you do a read, it's going to go and grab from the hard disk. When you do a write, it's going to push to the hard disk. The only other time you use this, other than attempting to make really bad I.O. programs, so this significantly slows down our program. If you speed, if you pull this out, we go up to like 70% CPU. 
So this adds like five seconds of those 5.7 seconds of this tone. It's, it's a really big hit in terms of I.O. time, which is great for our purposes. Uh, the only other time you really use OSync other than when you're purposely trying to make an I.O. bound benchmark is there are situations where if the computer crashed, it would really screw up your data. And if a computer crashes, you'll often lose anything in the buffers. So if you're in a situation where you can't afford for that to happen, you'll often use OSync on your writes. It slows you way down, but it guarantees that you actually have persistently stored data before it goes on to the next step. So that's the only other place you really see this use. So it's the OSync flag and the fact that you're using the open call that really makes this magic happen here. We then do the same thing. We build our output file name by calling, uh, by calling yeah. get PID and appending it to the end. That just gives us our local PID. And then we call open for the output file. And we're opening it in write-only mode. We have a few extra flags this time. DOCreate says that if the file doesn't exist, make a new one. DOTruncate says if the file does exist, overwrite it. And then OSync again, of course, is telling us that we want the slow version of I.O. Uh, and then because it might create files, we have to give it, these are just permit file permissions. So we're telling it, I want, I want read access, I want write, the user wants read access, the user wants write access, the group wants read access, the group wants write access, and everyone who's not my user or group has read access. This is equivalent to the chmod command. It's just whenever you create a file at this level, you have to tell what permissions you want. This would be uh, 664, no, 664 permissions. Professor Dave, if you didn't provide these um, those additional permissions, would it be that you messed the vault, whatever you messed with that No, if you don't provide these at all, it's no permissions. No permissions. Yeah, oh, that's not useful. So, uh, no, actually, I have a button here. Um, yeah, you have to specify these. These actually, you can't. You, you, these get masked against the UMask of the process. So you actually can't violate the UMask. Okay. The UMask is the limiting factor. Uh, but you have to provide, the, it, it essentially gives you the lesser of the two. Mm -hmm. So if you have none of these, you give all zeros when masked against produces all zeros. If you have these, it masks against mm -hmm. that, and then you get whatever the commonalities are. Anyway, the open files are the key component here. That's your takeaway. If you want to take advantage of OSYNC, you have to use open like this. The program itself, then, is pretty simple. It's a do loop. It reads from the input file into the transfer buffer of a specific size. It does some error checking. If it correctly, it updates the bytes read. It then, assuming we were able to read a full block, so this effectively is how it moves through the file. If we can't read a full block, we assume we're at the end of the file, we ignore it, and we just go to the next iteration of the loop. But if we aren't at the end of the file, if we get a full block size, we then go ahead and write that to the output file, do some error catching, update our statistics. This is the else case, so if we didn't get a full block, we're at the end of the file. Else seek tells it to go back to the beginning of the file. We're telling it to go back to zero bytes from the beginning of the file. So this is effectively what resets us to the end of the file, and then we keep going. And then we just do that until our total bytes written is equal to the number of bytes we requested, effectively. So we're going to keep looping through this until our output file is the size that requested. Then we just spit all of our statistics out to the screen, free our space, close our file descriptors, and exit. So the only real cleverness in here is, one, the fact that we've gone to using the Linux system calls, so read, write, open, close, instead of the, instead of the CSTRM library equivalents, and two, that we're using the OSYNC flag. Um, so if you're having trouble getting good I.O. bounds, this is an example for you guys to use. By all means, post any questions. I'll be paying attention over the next 48 hours or so. Um, I'll have office hours tomorrow. I may reschedule them so I can go to the colloquium, but I'll email you guys by tonight if I'm going to do that. Otherwise, be in touch. Have your stuff in by Friday night, and we'll get questions.